I'd like to say once again how grateful I am to be able to be with you all this week. We've been looking forward to this meeting for a long time, and we are thankful for the invitation to be here. We know quite a few of the families that are here, and we look forward this week to getting to know uh, the ones that we don't know. We, we're here to work. We've set aside this week to come and be with the church here, and we're planning to meet at the times that are scheduled and that are, have been announced on the flyers, but, but we're going to be here all week throughout the day, and if there's anything that, that I or my family can do uh, to help in anything, uh, especially those spiritual things, uh, then please let us know. We'd, we'd be glad to, to help in any way that we can with whatever work needs to be done. Uh, I've gone over in my mind, you know, things I could say, what I want to say to, to start out just by, you know, starting a gospel meeting, words of, of thanks, uh, words about Wes and Donna and, and the other families here that we know and love. But I just don't want to do that because uh, I want to get into the word. I don't want to be distracted by those things in my own mind. And there'll be time for, for some of that later this week. I certainly do have so much I would like to say, but, but we'll, we'll move into the lesson. And I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter. Uh, we're actually going to start in 2 Peter if you want to go ahead and turn there. But we'll be in 1 and 2 Peter this morning. A promise is something that we can uh, make very easily and just as easily we can, we can break it. And sometimes we break promises because we have no intention of keeping the promise when we made it. We just wanted to, to get someone off our back. We just wanted the, the circumstances to work out to our favor so we might promise something that we had no intention of promising. But then there are other times when we really do mean what we say and we make a promise that we really intend to keep. But because of circumstances beyond our control, we're not able to keep them. And hopefully if we're breaking promises as Christians, that that would be more of the, the realm that we're in, that we really want to do the thing that we said we're going to do, but we're just for whatever reason not able to, which I think should help us to go back and make sure when we are saying that we're going to do something that we think it through, that we're going to be able to do that. But when we're talking about promises that God has made to us, we're talking about someone who is not going to be faced with some unforeseen circumstance. That he just didn't see that coming, and so what he said he would do, well, he's just not going to be able to do it now. Or, or maybe something comes up in his way that, that he just doesn't have the power to then do what he said. We know with God that's not at all the case. So if the Lord promises us something, then we can, as we say, take that to the bank. He will do it. And those promises fall on both sides. Those promises are, are promises of blessing and they're promises of cursing. At home now, we're going through the period that we call the wandering in the wilderness. And because the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness to that generation died off that refused to go into the land. And as they're preparing to enter that second group uh, in Deuteronomy, Moses tells them just that. The Lord has has made promises, and he set two things before you, life and death. And they could be just as assured that if they were faithful to God, that he would bless them, he would give them the land, but if they were not, then the curses are what they could expect. The same Lord that moved Moses, spoke to Moses and told the people those things at that time is the same God we serve today. His promises are still very much the same as far as some for blessing and some for cursing, it's depending, dependent upon us and how we respond to the Lord's commands as to whether or not we'll receive those blessings or those curses. In this life, we, we face difficulty. We want to do what's right. I think all who are gathered here today, you're gathered here because you want to do what the Lord would have you to do. A lot of the places you could be this Sunday morning, it's cold outside, it's windy, you could stay at home and be in bed and just all kinds of things you could be doing. But you chose to be here, which tells me that you're interested in serving the Lord and doing what's right. But sometimes we face persecution. We face suffering that when we first committed ourselves to the Lord, we didn't necessarily understand that those kinds of things were going to happen to us, that we'd be called to, 
to give that much of a sacrifice. Uh, but the Lord didn't somehow dupe us. He didn't pull the wool over our eyes and promise us one thing and give us another. The Lord was very clear to his disciples that there would be sufferings that would come. As he talks to those apostles in John 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, specifically 14 and 15, he lets them know that they're going to be hated by the world for his sake. And uh, I won't read it. I've, I won't read all of it. I've got a quote uh, written in the back of my Bible. I won't tell you who I got this quote from, but it's, it's uh, very insightful. I'm just going to read the last part of it. Uh, in talking about the world, is that it never will love you if you're doing what's right and serving God. It put our Lord on a cross that nailed him to a piece of wood. Is it going to be your friend? Not if you're Jesus' friend. That may sound familiar to some of you here. But, but that's the truth, though. If we're Jesus' friend, if we're serving God, the world's not going to love us, and we're going to face suffering. We're going to face persecution. And, and that's what Peter's writing about here in really 1st and 2nd Peter. Peter had faced some persecution. He'd been through some sufferings and he knew what it meant to be faced with a situation where if I, if I do the right thing, it's going to mean big trouble. And on that occasion there, as Jesus was on trial, he failed in holding up to what he had promised the Lord of not forsaking him. But Peter's learned from that, and now he's trying to warn others. Be steadfast, as we talked about this morning. Uh, don't, don't give in to those sufferings. The sufferings that they faced in the first century were, were things that we would just have a, a really hard time understanding. Uh, there, there were sufferings that are just unimaginable to us today. As we see here on the slide from 2 Peter Chapter 1, there in verse 4, is where we're taking the, the text for the lesson, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But that escape is not going to be easy for these brethren that Peter's writing to. They're going to face some very, very difficult times. He knew he was, they were going to need strength to overcome those things. When you look at some of the historical writings, and there's more that we could look at, but this is just one quote from uh, Tacitus in his Annals. And you'll notice there at the, the bottom of the page, if you're close enough that you can read that, he talks about here uh, sufferings and tortures that Nero inflicted upon early Christians. And I'll just pick up their uh, reading where it says, um, mockery of every kind. If I can, I'll just read it off here. Uh, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. I remember before I became a Christian, I was studying with a brother up in Kentucky, and he was talking about the history of the early church, and he got to Nero, and he was talking about Nero and lighting his gardens with lamps of Christians as they were lit to, as we see here, uh, illuminate the night. And I remember thinking when he said that, really, is that really, is that like, just like legend or folklore? Uh, but but it's true. And we read we read from Hebrews 11 a little bit earlier, or at least it alluded to it, but the end of Hebrews 11 talks about the, the trials and the sufferings that, that people faced who were faithful to the Lord. So when we think about suffering today, we recognize, at least here in the United States, we don't suffer like that. that that's not the, the level that we have to, to suffer to. But I tell you, I think sometimes the sufferings that we face can be more dangerous. I have known brethren that I think were just like Peter in the garden, who when confronted, when faced with, with physical danger, they'd pull out their sword and they'd be ready to fight. 
not thinking that they were going to slay that enemy in front of them, most likely they're going to die. They're going to go down fighting. And I think they would pick up the sword. I think they would fight that fight. And they would give their life in defense of the Lord like Peter tried to do. But they won't live for the Lord. They, they won't go day to day and face the, the temptations and the things in this life that require us to sacrifice uh, on, on some levels uh, much less of a sacrifice, but they won't give up those small things in order to serve the Lord as he would have us to. So when we say we don't face the sufferings that they faced then, don't minimize the sufferings. Don't minimize the, the temptation the persecution that we face because just like Peter hours later denied the Lord when he finds himself there in the courtyard, we too can easily find ourselves denying God when put to the test, when asked, do you really have an association with this Jesus who's called the Christ? Uh, we may say by our actions, no, we don't. So what can we look at here? What was Peter trying to do to help these brethren to be able to stand in the face of that persecution? And how can we be helped? Well, the passage we read. We've been giving, given these exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He uses that word precious there in verse 4, at least in the New King James. And as you read through First and Second Peter, you find that there are a number of things that are precious uh, in the sight of God. And, and that's important to understand because things that are precious in the sight of God, God are not always the same things that are precious to us. They should be, but we don't always look at things the way that God looks at them. When you look there in chapter one of first Peter uh, in verse seven, he speaks of the genuineness of their faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. And so there you have a comparison between gold and faith. And, and what does he say? But that faith is much more precious than gold. Yet if you had sent out flyers to the surrounding area and said, this coming Sunday morning, we're going to begin uh, a meeting. And during that meeting, we're going to enhance your bank account. We've got gold. You come and we're just going to distribute it. Uh, first come, first serve. I imagine there'd be quite a line out the road there, people trying to get in here to get that gold, if they truly believe that that's what they could have. But when you tell people you can come and have your strength, your faith strengthened through being with brethren and worshiping with brethren and, and all of the things that we're able to do here today, looking at God's word, well, you're not going to have a whole lot who respond because they don't see the preciousness of faith. He goes on in verse 19 of the same chapter to talk about the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without Spot. Now surely we understand the blood of Christ is precious. There's none like it. But then sometimes we're like those that the Hebrew writer talks about in chapter 10 in verse 26 who sin willfully. We, we know what the Lord has told us. We know what God's commands are. And yet we just turn a blind eye. We ignore it and we go on and do what we want to do. And what he goes on to say there is that when we do that, we're trampling the, the, the sun under our feet. We're counting the blood of the covenant by which we've been sanctified a common thing. We're not thinking it's precious at that point. So while, yes, on paper it's precious, and yes, that's true, do we always act like it is? Do we do what the Lord would have us to do, even in the face of those temptations, knowing that a failure to do so is our counting that blood a common thing? We, you, People, there's... Sometimes I hesitate to go too far into something, but th there's a lady, uh, she's going to put her husband away. And she knew it was wrong. She knows what the Bible says about that. We studied with her about it again just to make sure. and uh, She knew what it said, but, but in her mind she said, it's just what i got to do. And when we asked her about her eternal salvation, her response was, well, I'm just going to depend on the mercy of God. But 
in doing what she knows God says you should not do, again, the Hebrew writer said you're, you're, you're counting that blood a common thing. She just thinks she can go back to the well and the blood of Christ is just going to keep cleansing her and it's not. And so that precious blood, it is precious. We need to treat it as if it's precious. In chapter 2, uh, you look over there in verse 4. In this entire section, he's talking about precious things. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. It's not hard to see in those verses that we're looking at Jesus, our chief cornerstone, that, that one who was the, the son of God, who is the son of God. It's not hard to see that he's precious. But people didn't regard him as precious. They rejected him. But I think in that same section, we see that it's not just Jesus here who we're being shown is precious to the Lord, but that we too, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, precious to God. If that first living stone there in verse 4 uh, is precious, then certainly those stones that are added to the house are also precious to the Lord. Look over in chapter 3, still in First Peter chapter 3. And verse 4, uh, let's start in verse 2. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Do we, do we realize that? That uh, gentle and quiet spirit, that incorruptible beauty, that's precious in the sight of God. I know uh, that young ladies and, and young men alike, older ladies and older men alike, they, they understand the outside uh, is precious. And we know that because a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort is spent trying to make it look precious. But what God says is precious is that inward person. Very precious, in fact, is what he says. If we truly believe that, if we understand that, then maybe we'd spend the time and effort on the inside that we do on the outside. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, we've already mentioned in verse 4, those precious promises that were made. And that's really what we want to, to focus on here. Uh, back up in verse 1, he mentions faith again as being precious. I don't want to overlook that. But it's those precious promises that are going to help us to overcome. They're going to help us to stand, as we talked about earlier. It's going to help us to realize the promises of blessing that God has uh, in store for us. When I say realize, I don't mean understand, comprehend. I mean that we get to partake of those things. But what are these precious promises? You know, Peter doesn't hear in 2 Peter 1, just go on and give us a list in verses 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, here are the precious promises. Uh, so what are they? I, well, there's a lot of things that could be said. I want to look at three things that I think we find in First and 2 Peter that are promises by God that are precious and that by understanding these precious promises that we can, that we can hold on to them and we can, again, realize them at the end of our life. The first thing, if you look back in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, that I think we find is a, a precious promise that Peter is going to write about, is, is forgiveness. Now, in this passage, you're, you're not really going to see that word. We're not going to see forgiveness specifically spoken of. But when he says there in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, well, what we're reading about there is forgiveness. There, there's more than that involved in that verse, but you can't have uh, a new life in Christ without being forgiven. We can't have a hope without forgiveness. And so the, by the mercy of God, we have been given the precious promise that God will forgive our sins if we respond accordingly to the gospel of Christ. When you continue reading there in chapter 1, over in verse 18, he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And he continues on there in verse 22 to say, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And all of that, the idea of being begotten again, being redeemed uh, later in that, uh, in chapter 2, he's going to talk about us being uh, a chosen generation in verse 9, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. To... To have the mercy of God, to have the, the opportunity to be forgiven. What a, what a precious promise that is. In Psalm 51, David there is pouring his heart out to the Lord after his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, he doesn't presume that the Lord's just going to, to just forget and forgive and everything's just going to be all right. But he's pleading with the Lord. He's, he's begging the Lord to cleanse him, to make him whole. Not just forgive, but, but to, to create in him a clean heart. That's what David prayed for. But what David knew that it was going to take, he'll say in verse 17, I believe it is. Let me, I don't want to misquote that. Let me turn back there. Let's just turn and read it. Psalm 51. Verse 17, David says, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. David doesn't just say, Lord, forgive me and move on. He shows the, his broken spirit. He understands what it would take to make him whole. And he understands that broken and contrite heart that is needed in order to, to realize that forgiveness from God. Now, when you read the account back in 2 Samuel chapter 11, you, you don't have that prayer listed for us there. Uh, you have Nathan's coming to David, and you have him laying out there the, uh, the, the sin that David is involved with in chapter 12. And then... When Nathan says to David, you are the man, you're the one I'm talking about, David responds in verse 13 and says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Now, in that short verse, we have the confession of David's sin, and we have Nathan saying, the Lord's put it away. God has forgiven you of that. But it, it's not just that quick and easy. Uh, it takes that broken and contrite heart that you see in David that he was willing to pour out to the Lord. And so to have that kind of a response in that spirit is the only way that we're going to enjoy those blessings. To some, sin's no big deal because, again, the, the blood of Christ is there. He died on the cross. We just say, I, I, I'm sorry. We'll come partake of the Lord's Supper and that somehow, you know, 
just cleanses us and we're good to go. Uh, but that's not what the scriptures teach. It is a great and precious promise that God has made, but it's a promise that we can obtain only when we seek it humbly, knowing that sin is a big deal. And if we think we just go out and, and sin and sin and we're going to get God's forgiveness, then we don't understand this is a precious promise made to those who will be faithful to the Lord. He also, I think here in this first, cha this first letter, talks about the, uh, the promise of fellowship. Look in chapter 2 still with me and look down in verse 25. 1 Peter 2, verse 25, he says, You were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, we can read that verse, and we are Jesus as the shepherd. He's the overseer, and so we're back. But understand what it means to be back. Understand what it means to be able to return to that shepherd and overseer of our soul. We we're talking about sin and how some think it's no big deal, but we need to understand sin separates us from God. Uh, that's the promise that God made to Adam and Eve in the garden. The, the, the day you eat of it, you shall die. And they surely did die there in chapter 3 when they ate that fruit that God had forbidden. As Ezekiel will talk about in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the soul that sins shall die. Uh, the, the son's not going to bear the guilt of the father. The father's not going to bear the guilt of the son. But, but be sure the soul that sins, they are going to die. And he's, I don't think he's just talking about a physical death there. He's talking about the separation we experience. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 talk about how the Lord's hand is not short, that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your sins have hidden his face from you. It's your iniquity that is keeping that separation from God and that salvation. So sin has separated us, but here we're reading that Peter says we've, we've returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Do, do we understand how, how precious that fellowship is? I think about uh, Zacchaeus who got up in the trees looking to see the Lord. He's having difficulty at first, but he gets up in the tree. You know, the, the, his short stature wasn't the only thing standing in his way. Uh, the crowd wasn't the only thing standing in his way. There was pride, there was sin standing in his way. But when Jesus saw him and he says, you need to come on down, I'm going to your house. I think there are a lot of people that said, Lord, just meet me here on the road and we can do this right here and you don't have to come to my house. Uh, they wouldn't be, Jesus wouldn't be welcomed in the house because then he gets to see all their stuff. Then he gets to see how they really live and a lot of people don't want that. But if we're going to have true fellowship with Christ, and, and realize that precious promise, we've got to invite him into our home. He has to be have, have access to every nook and cranny there in the home. And he's there not as some inspector trying to fail the home so that you don't get the mortgage. He's there to help us to find the problems and fix the problems. He doesn't just illuminate and shine the light and say, there it is, deal with it, and I'll come back. And he's there to, to again, help us to fix that. But if we don't have that fellowship with him, then we can't have that. I think we see that in, in chapter 3. Catch up here. In chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We might, if we're not careful, read the first part of that verse as a threat, and the second part as a as a, as a blessing. The eyes of the Lord are on you. His ears are open. So be careful. God's watching, but he'll listen to your prayers. But that's not what Peter is saying. This, this is all a blessing. The eyes of the, the Lord sees. The Lord knows. When David would, would cry out and talk about being in, in the behold, uh, you know, in the death, you're there. Uh, that's not a, that's a great thing that the Lord knows when uh, i got to get my, my, uh, my short names right. Jonah, that's who I'm thinking. I was going to say Lot, and I was going to say Job, but it wasn't either one of those. It was Jonah. When he's sinking down in, in the depths of the sea, the Lord didn't just hear his cry. The Lord saw him. He knew the trouble he was in, and he's there willing to help. But, but in order to, to have the Lord's help, in order to have the Lord's eyes on us and his ears open to us, we have to have that relationship. There has to be that fellowship 
that God has said that we can have with him. Look with me in Psalm 34. I mentioned this just a moment ago, but we'll, we'll read it more uh, here. Again, making the same point, but to recognize the blessing it is to have the Lord continually with us. Psalm 34, we'll pick up reading there in verse, uh, verse 4. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This, more, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. I think that's where Peter's quoting from when we read there verse 12. But when you read the psalm in its fullness, and we read all of it, but you see more that the, the, the eyes of the Lord are on the right. He's there to help. He's there to save. He's there to comfort. He's there to pull us out of those dangerous situations that we sometimes get ourselves in. But again, that only comes to those that are in fellowship with him. We look in James chapter 4 and thinking about the ears of the Lord being open to our cry. James chapter 4 and verse 2, he says, You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain, you fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You know, it's an interesting connection that James makes there at the beginning of chapter 4. He talks about prayers and not receiving the answer to prayer, not receiving the things that you need, you're not asking right. But then he goes into talking about how friendship with the world is enmity with God. And, and I think that's a point that, that Peter is trying to help the brethren here see that to have this precious promise of God's presence and God's help, uh, you, you've got to be with God. And then he will be open to you. But if you're thinking to make yourself a friend of the world, don't think you can go do that six days a week and then come here and receive the, the promises of God, the blessings of God. We have to forsake the world and cleave to God and not the other way around. And is that, is that the, the time signal? That you, you've gone a little long, you need to speed this up. Well, uh, hopefully not, but we're, we're getting there. You know, it just happens to be right at 12 o'clock. I didn't even see that, but... Uh, Continuing on there in 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3 beginning in verse 18, he says, For Christ also suffered once for the sins, once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the spirit, but made alive by the, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were being saved, were saved through water. 
There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, now follow what he's talking about here. Verse 18, he says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. And then in the middle part there, we, we read about being saved. Noah was saved through water. We can be saved through water. Verse 21, Jesus has gone in verse 22 into heaven, is at the right hand of God. And then chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. When we talk about fellowship with Christ, we're, we're talking about a relationship with him, but we're also talking about sharing together with him in that relationship. And here Peter's talking about sharing in the sufferings of Christ. If we're going to maintain our relationship with God, we, we've got to be thoughtful, we've got to be intentional, and we have to be willing to suffer with Christ. When you look at what uh, the apostles say in Acts chapter 5, after they've been threatened in chapter 4, Peter and John, uh, they, they don't give up doing what the Lord would have them to do. In chapter 5, they go and preach and they're imprisoned, they're freed, they go and preach again, and this time they're beaten for their obedience. And after they're threatened and let go again, we're told in verse 41, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They shared in the fellowship of his suffering. And so if we think to enjoy the blessings of that fellowship, to, to enjoy, as we read about in the psalm, the comfort of knowing God is always with us. And, and just all that comes with being a part of that family, we also have to recognize another thing that comes along with that is we've got to be willing to suffer. We've got to be willing to give of ourselves if we want those precious promises. And, and that is a promise that God has made to us, that we can have that fellowship. And then the last thing I want to see is the future that God has promised us. In 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, we see there in verse 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Entrance will be supplied abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. That's a wonderful future. When John the Baptist was promised to Zacharias and Elizabeth, one of the questions that Zacharias had was, uh, what kind of child will this be? He wondered about the future of this young boy. And, of course, he was told some great things about John and what he would do. But the ultimate future for John, the ultimate future for all of us as we're thinking about what's to come is this future, this everlasting home, everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we get to be a part of. What a promise that is. What a blessing that is. In chapter 2, well, actually, back in chapter 1, um, he says in verse 13, Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And so not only does he talk about that everlasting kingdom, but he talks about a resurrected body. And you say, well, I didn't see that in verse uh, 14, but if he's going to put off this tent, if he's going to put off this physical body this flesh and blood that he's currently in then he has to understand there's going to be something to come after that that he is looking forward to and when you look on over in chapter 3 
we see that he recognizes the future includes the day of the Lord. And in verse 10, it's going to come as a thief in the night. And there are a lot of people who are deathly afraid of the return of the Lord. And they think about when, you, when you're talking about the, the coming of Christ, that that's, we're just trying to get people to be afraid and tremble and fear. and make. Not to, if you're not prepared, then I, I want you to be afraid. I would want you to fear. I'd want you to shake because it will be a terrible day. But that, that's not all that Peter is saying here. I don't even know if that's his primary point in writing to these Christians. Yes, he wants them to understand that if you're not with the Lord, if you don't have that fellowship, if you haven't been forgiven of your sins, then you're not on the right side, and, and there is a, a future ahead of you that you don't want. You wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy. But he's also telling them that there's something that, that you're going to be uh, rewarded with. Look at what, in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. So he speaks there of a new heaven and a new earth. We didn't read verse uh, 13, but that's what he, he, he speaks. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we're looking forward to. That's what he goes on to say in verse 14, looking forward to these things. Be diligent. So that future that has been promised to us by God is attainable. It's attainable because of his grace and mercy through his son, Jesus Christ, and the sacrifice that he made. But in order to realize all of those precious promises, we have to do what he says there in those last verses that we read. The conclusion that we find is given to us here by Peter. It's his conclusion. Be diligent uh, to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens by having your sins washed away. It happens by after having your sins washed away, walking a pure life, a righteous, a blameless life before God and continuing to seek forgiveness for sins that we commit. Understanding that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Uh, the, you've got time. You're here this morning. The Lord has blessed you with an opportunity. If you're not in the Lord's everlasting kingdom if you're not one who's had your sins washed away then the lord is giving you an opportunity to be saved but one day that long suffering is going to come to an end we didn't read verse 9 but you go back to chapter 3 verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness some say it's been a long time since he made that promise he hasn't made good on it yet but he will and rest assured he absolutely will and so don't delay Take the opportunity, the time that you have now to make things right. And then finally, he gives that warning. Beware, verse 17, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. But in verse 18, the, the flip side of that is, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's how we can keep from falling from that steadfastness and being led away with the error of the wicked. I was at a gospel meeting. Someone else was preaching one time, and there was a lady at the end. Uh, we were talking in the back, and she said, Now, when you preach, do you offer a proper invitation? And I thought, well, what, what are you talking about? And she went through, and, she, and I think you all understand what maybe she meant by that. It was interesting because the brother that preached that night, he was, his assignment was Acts chapter 2, and he, he finished with what Peter said in Acts chapter 2. And left that for the congregation to respond to. She didn't feel that, that was uh, that was good enough. Uh, this morning, we're going to finish with what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I hope you understand that's an invitation to respond to these precious promises that have been made. 
And we have that time now. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of invitation. As we sing that song, I hope that you think about uh, your future. And as you think about your future, be thinking about your fellowship that you have with God. And if it's not there, then seek that forgiveness that has been promised to us, that we can have it and we can come and be a, a, a reborn child of God. Uh, the question that we're going to sing about is, are you washed in the blood? If not, please let us help you with that this morning. But would you come? Let us know how we can help you while we stand and sing. Have you been?